I think what a lot of people don't realise is that when top is done on air, I am a bank manager. <laughs> I just take my tie off and popped, uh, popped over to see you, get you out of a bit of a hole. It's nice to see you in a suit, and it's very lovely to have you here because Jeremy did step in. Uh, you know, he's always welcome on the programme because you're always a great guest, but you did step in and help us out, and I appreciate that. No, that's very kind, and the £75 will come in handy. <laughs> well, I must say, walking out, when you say to the audience, ladies and gentlemen, tonight we have Robert Downey Jr., Demi Moore and Gwyneth Paltrow, but they're not actually here, so we've got Jeremy <laughs> Clarkson. <laughs> I detected a very noticeable groan. <laughs> well, you're one of our biggest... Sam, they've come to see you two, but they couldn't make it. So here's Timmy Mallet. <laughs> suit of noise. He, uh, he was... We did call him before you, but uh, <laughs> even so... Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's exactly uh, one year and one day since Richard um, endured that awful crash that we all yes, read about. And we were, uh, one year and one day ago. Yeah. I don't know how much you remember it from now, but how have things settled down since then? What do you think of it when you look back at it from, from this vantage point one year ago? Um, well, it, it's, it, it was a big old event, obviously, and uh, it's, a, it's a long old journey. And I think whenever anybody's got over any kind of head injury... Brain trauma, your head trauma, yeah. yeah. Anybody who's got over anything like that will know that you get to the end of each week, you look back, and that's when you realise how you weren't actually better, and you think, I'm better. And then you get to the end of that week and realise, nope, I still wasn't better, but now... And it goes on and on and on. Because but, you gave us your first television interview since, since it, uh, when, when it first happened, this was yeah. a while back. Is it true you, you can't actually remember doing that? No, not at all. I've not, that's why I got lost in there, didn't you see? Yeah, Richard Hammond and, well, one person clapped, thank you. <laughs> and I, I couldn't find the door because they all assumed, oh, little fella, he's been here before, yeah, he, he knows the ropes. Yeah, but that's not so much memory, that's just stupidity. It could just it? be that. <laughs> it could just be that. Well, I mean, it could have been briefed. But you don't remember us having that conversation then? That, the, the did you touch me in an... Uh, no, <laughs> but we did have a bet. You bet me £5,000 that Take That would not get back together. <laughs> no, no, fair enough. Um, but that must be, I would have thought, quite a, a strange thing to deal with, knowing that there are chunks missing from, from fairly, fairly recent history since the accident. Yeah, only since. I mean, a perfect memory up to the accident. So really, so everything up to that crash? Yeah. Right up to the point when the car went over and I thought something along the lines of, oh, bugger, that's that then. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah, right up to that point. But then afterwards, it's a... Bit hazy so me. how much is how much is, when you say it's hazy uh, you have a dim recollection of some things or whole periods of just oh, whole gone. periods have just gone because uh, I had a sort of twenty second memory so I was easy to entertain <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> read, read a paper yeah. read it again read it again <laughs> um, so I was very confused for weeks I don't remember I was in Leeds Hospital for a while and they looked after me magnificently I'm sure but I have no recollection sadly right. uh, and then in Bristol Hospital for a while I remembered some of that. But, no, big chunks of it went missing. Um, you have a book out which neatly coincides with the year since it happened. Um, and what's lovely about the book is that it's not just written by you, it's written by you and your wife. Uh, because, presumably, A, it's her side of the story, but B, also, there were chunks that you couldn't possibly tell because you were out of it or you can't remember. Yeah, we wanted to write it, and then we thought, right! And they said, go ahead, do it. And then we thought, oh, bugger, I can't remember most of it, so my wife Mindy agreed to write half of it. Yeah. Really well! Yeah. Well, her, her half is the, is the easiest to read yes, I know. and the most entertaining. Unfortunately, well, because they said to us, do you want... Because you know half of these things are written by ghostwriters. Yeah, I do know. You don't have to whisper. We've got microphones. They can hear you now. It's not written by a ghostwriter. No, but yours, you, you genuinely well, They said to us, book. you want a ghostwriter. No, no, not at all. We want yeah. to do it ourselves. I, I, that's insulting. Then we sat down and, oh, my God, we've got to do it. And then we agreed that Mindy would have to do half of it. And I said to her, look, darling, you've never written professionally before. This is my <laughs> world now. It's quite scary for you. So what I want you to do, I'm not going to sit and hold your hand and go through it. I want you to write your bit and then send it off to the editor. And then when he sends back his feedback. If he's a bit cruel, don't be hurt. Uh, let's go through it and we'll reconstruct it. So they, she wrote it, sent it off, they wrote back, yeah, can we commission some novels? <laughs> <laughs> Ten times better than I'll ever be at writing. <laughs> Let me ask you about some of the things on Top Gear, because being on that show must be, uh, in many ways, it's a, it's a licence to live out fantasies, I would have thought. There must be ideas or things you've always fancied doing, or other people come up with ideas and you think, OK, we'll give it a shot, like, go, like mm. driving to the North Pole, which is, mm. which is quite an absurd idea, really. But you, you were the first people to do that, weren't you? You and Clark. Uh, Jeremy and I were the first people to drive a car to the Magnetic North Pole, yes. That's incredible. Well, the interesting thing is, when you set off, um, you think, yes, this is going to be fantastic, and there's going to be this marvellous... Uh, magnificent desolation, as I think Buzz Aldrin said of the moon, and, and you set off, and it is, and there are these magnificent ice sculptures that nature has formed, and they are random, yet, yet structurally perfect, and they're beautiful, and, and that's fabulous. And then the next day, there are these random art forms that nature has produced, and they're, they're structurally perfect, and they're beautiful, but they're random, and then you get up the next day, and, they, and you look at and there's these ice forms. And I think probably the best, way, the best way to understand what it's like to drive to the North Pole is to... If you sit in front of your fridge 
on a chair and then open the door of the icebox and look at it for two weeks. It's pretty much like that. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, I had to do it with Jeremy Clarkson. And, uh, you know, he's a great bloke and I'm very fond of him. Uh, but uh, there are some things he can't do. Uh, put a tent up, light a stove, um, sleep in a civilised way. <laughs> so, so you are sleeping in the tent together, the two of you? You're sharing the tent? Yes. OK, and so that's not something that most of us can say we've ever done, shared a tent with Jeremy Clarkson. Uh, no. He's not, a, he's not a kind of considerate sleeper then? He's a, a snore? Or? Well, he says I snore, and I accept that I possibly do occasionally. What, what he does is he, he, he gets into his, his uh, cocoon sleeping bag. You know, these are the Arctic ones. They're, they're, the TOG rating is 5,000 or something. And <laughs> the tape of things. And he gets in, and he sort of gets in swearing a bit and, you know, complaining. And he works in his sleeping bag, and he starts to do the zip-up. And we're lying side by side. Well, head to toe, I mean, you know. But, um, and I'm watching him, and the, and the zip comes up, and he's muttering and muttering, and he pulls it up, and then he gets, he gets his head, and he pulls the zip, and he keeps going, and he pulls it all over his head until he's entirely inside it. <laughs> and then, whilst he's asleep, he twitches and blasphemes. <laughs> so that every now and then I'd wake up in the middle of the night, and I'd think, my God, there's this giant swearing maggot in the tent. <laughs> It's actually Jeremy in his brown sleeping bag. It's hideous. I imagine that you're quite close after an experience of that. And you did it, do you bond over those kind of things? No. <laughs> so this isn't a beautiful romance that we're witnessing here? No. <laughs> Although I'm the, a the, bit doc annoyed. the doctor asked me, we had a doctor in our, in our team just to keep an eye on us, and I remember right at the end she sat me in the little communal tent that we put up where yeah. we all huddle around this tiny little stove which has got, like, a match burning in it. And she said, she said so, James, you know, we're... Will your life be, be better or worse for this experience? And I decided that it would be worse because occasionally I'd remember it. <laughs> <laughs> People are trying to blame Top Gear. Uh, they try and blame Top Gear for most things, it seems, but they're trying to blame Top Gear for the volcano going off in Iceland. I, I have to suppose I, it's fair enough. We are entirely responsible. We honest, genuinely did do it. <laughs> How did you do it? <laughs> no, we did. How? Um, Why? When it first started sort of smoking, we thought it'd be quite good fun to go up there and drive over it. You know, how far? Yeah. So, um, obviously, it's quite dangerous, so we sent James May <laughs> <laughs> to, go, to go up there, and he drove onto it, and the, the, the tyres actually caught fire. I mean, he was driving yeah. over the lava, and then, bugger me, <laughs> and that was it, no more air travel. So, James May is responsible. James May no, is... And there really is, I mean, there's no way out of that. I mean, the Daily Mail inevitably rang up and said, you've done it. So we just thought, well, it's the only thing we can do is go, yes, we have. Now, were you affected by the volcano? You said yeah, you were no, away. No, were I you was, away? I was in um, Poland when it went off, or Berlin, somewhere, not here, anyway. <laughs> um, and, but it, and it was just, it was the most fantastic day. I was with James and Richard, actually, we'd been filming out there, and it was, it was a really entertaining day, sort of ricocheting from various European capital to European capital. And, and we got back, but only about six hours after we would have got back had we just flown normally. So, not really a very exciting story, unfortunately. So, you didn't really, but you weren't caught up in the whole chaos then? Yeah, you we were... were caught up in the chaos. There was the most marvellous, well, rather pitiful scene, really, at uh, Charles de Gaulle Airport that we got to just before it shut. And um, the car hire place was just absolutely, you know, there was nothing left. Although we had said to the car rental company, I can't name, beginning with age, um, <laughs> the first time I've ever done this, listen, if you don't save us a car, we will unleash the forces of hell on you. <laughs> this is Top Gear, so just pay attention. So we, there was just one car left in the car park. So what was, was the car? Us. What did you get? It was oh, a performance? Oh, awful thing. No, dreadful. Sort of the Ford Diesel, some sort. <laughs> um, uh, now, hold on. When you guys are together, if I'm out with friends and we're driving, when I'm driving, I always am the one who drives us back because I don't drink, mm -hmm. OK? Mm -hmm. When you're out, if you're out with, uh, with Richard and with James, mm -hmm. uh, is, there the, is there a degree of competition, if you're all sober, as to who will get to drive? Do you all want to drive? No, that was the very funny thing. As soon as we realised after quite a hectic day's filming and then we'd been to five European countries, it, we quickly realised that one of us was going to have to drive that last leg, that was going to have to be done in a car, and it just became a competition to see who could drink the most, so they couldn't drive them. <laughs> <laughs> and because Hammond's quite small, he'd only had one beer by the time we got there and it was down to him. So he had to drive you back? He had to drive us back, but he's so law-abiding. Oh, God, it's just got to it. We have really got to get to Cali in a big hurry. you really got to, oh, I don't want to get caught speeding. <laughs> You're a presenter on Top Gear, for God's sake. No, it's 80 miles an hour, which is the speed limit, but all the way up there. Yeah, but 80 miles an hour, this is the bloke who almost blew himself up on a rocket ship or something. Yeah, no he didn't. He wants to that was the in. critical point. He didn't actually kill himself. He's the least sympathetic friend anyone could have. 80 miles an hour, so we're never going to get back. I've had both the other fellows on the show from Top Gear. I've had Richard and Jim, and I'm a bit worried about 
I think that I think Jeremy does have a bit of a thing for Richard, or vice versa, because I think Richard's trying to make himself look. There's there's Jeremy with his lovely wife uh, Francine, who I've met many times. Okay, mm. I think, and I don't know if you've seen what Hammond's doing his hair recently, but I think he's trying to make himself look more like her. If you look, you see, <laughs> and if you look at this, you can see what he's aiming for. I think that's what he's that's what he's shooting for, and I'm concerned. I'm con I, I want you to intervene. I wish you hadn't shown me that. <laughs> I'd like to apologise to Francie Clarkson on behalf of everybody here. Actually, but... I've seen better crashes, to be honest. No, no, was, it's, a, it's a good crash. By now, I'm faintly disappointed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, joking aside, you have stared death in the face. You've, you know, but that must be, I would have thought, when that dawns on you, and we all kind of blithely kind of go, go about it as if it's not going to happen to us, but I'm sure there must be a moment where you know, it really comes home. And I would have thought after something like that is, it, was there a period, did you get depressed? Did you engage with that, deal with that? No, I didn't get depressed about that, not at all, no. I mean, it, it did bring home a sense of my own mortality. Danger of this becoming depressing, sorry. Um, no, it, it, it did, it made it very apparent. But I mean, at the time when the car went over, I wasn't screaming and panicking. There was nothing more I could do. I pulled the lever to deploy the parachute, it didn't. So I thought, well, that's that then. There's no, next thing on my to-do list was to die. It wasn't arg. There was nothing else I could do as far as I was concerned, I was going to. So th th that thought stayed with me, but it didn't make me horribly depressed. Why would we be programmed to be hideously depressed by it? Because it's inevitable. I'm going, you know, we're all, none of us getting out of this one alive, etc. This is nice. Friday yeah, night, I this is happening. <laughs> 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 I, I still think I still think Man they, talking about death. No, they, they might still find something. By the time, you know, by the time, because we're about, about the same age, aren't we? By the time we find... <laughs> by the time we get near, near death, they'll have found something, won't they? Something like well, from, what? you know, they'll find something from a lizard or something. You know, something that keeps you going. Now, Jeremy, you recently became 50, so yeah. it's a milestone in anyone's life. You That's a milestone. Four months to go. I've got more than that, haven't I? What month is it November now? November is your birthday, yeah, yeah. isn't it? So what month is it now? Not, I'm a stalker or anything, I just know that. <laughs> Where are we? May? I've got six months. April? Then. I've got half a year. Half a year I'm to go. I'm still mid 40s then. I'm warning so, you. Uh, I'm warning you, you won't like it. I don't like it already. No, you won't like it because it's every morning you wake up and a bit of your body that worked perfectly well yesterday <laughs> has stopped in the night. Which now that, stops first? Well, this is, <laughs> this is the worrying thing, if we're honest. I mean, I was blessed with a hair hole, you know, bald at the back and getting fat. You look good, you look good, you look good. Ish. OK, not so good. It's an expensive suit, masking many, many things. But what, I woke up on the morning of my 50th birthday okay. with a terrible skin disease. I mean, what? properly bad skin Harry, disease. That's what a hard way to start your 50th year. So you woke up on your 50th birthday with some sort of scabies? I'm like a grey face. Oh, God. With a hair hole and then a scab. A weeping <laughs> scab. That's all under this suit. There's just a weeping. Wow. wow and this is. Because I horrible. would imagine something fairly catastrophic is going to befall you. Be, no. Well, your hair's quite good still, isn't it? Quite good. Through. I look incredible for my hair. <laughs> this is isn't what. Isn't that right? Don't you think, ladies and gentlemen? Yeah. He does. But yeah. I got mistaken for a teenager yesterday. Internally. Internally. I do produce good. smells that would make, uh, make a whole football stadium weep. Or melt. Have you, do you do that? Something comes no. at me sometimes and I think, when did I eat plastic? <laughs> no. But that'll be it. It'll be, it'll, your bowel will fall off. Your bowel can't it, fall it, Your bowel isn't on the outside, it can't fall off. It could just flop down it on the It could prolapse. Exactly. Something terrible. And it, you'll just wake up. As all you look forward to in your first 50 years is things get better and better and better. It's you great. get healthier and you have more sex and yeah. you get more money and you have more fun and you go to yeah, all the countries. Best years of your life and the then you get to 50 and all you have to look forward to is bits stopping working until something catastrophic goes wrong and then it's that's it, you're dead. Oh my God. But the first 50 years you have a massive party. The next one you have a massive party and you're not there because you're in a box at it. <laughs> What's the well, why don't we just ship? Why don't ship... I have a funeral now? That's a good Shall idea. Should we just ship you off to Dignitas? Do you well, want just... to do that? In a really fast coffin. I've considered it. <laughs> the other thing as well is you just... haven't seriously considered it. I have. Though. I don't want to die in a. Di well, I don't want. Do well, you, you don't want to die, don't go to Dignitas. <laughs> do you not think every morning when you wake up, I wonder if today's the day I'm going to no, die? No, I don't. <laughs> Who starts a day like that? Me. Well, it's because you're a big scab on legs, but if you were, <laughs> so I'm put some cream on that, you'll feel fine. Um, but, uh, don't you do it? Is it just me? Yes. Do you just think, will it be painful, will it be now? No. 
Why <laughs> but look, look at this way, Jeremy. Here's the thing. I'm an optimist in life, okay, and I'm a fairly cheery bloke, okay. Uh, and when I wake up in the morning, sometimes, if, you know, sometimes I think, yeah, okay, I maybe I feel a bit down. I look in the mirror and I say, take that frown, turn it upside down. Okay, have a nice day. Because if you, you might want to remember that. Because if you <laughs> go through life feeling down and all, you know, old Eeyore over I don't there, know, grumpy I boots, be lying down like this, yeah, yeah. ready for this, no? Then that's no it's long enough. I can't. Then that's no, don't spread your disease all over the couch. <laughs> because, <laughs> yeah, the, the whole, the whole thing is a scabies zone now. Um, say, say it with me. Say, take that frown, turn it upside down. Say, uh, see how it feels. Ready? Take the fountain upside down. No, no, down. no. Take that frown, turn it upside down. Ready? One, two, three. Take. Take that fountain. No, not fountain. <laughs> frown. You frown. Frown. It's Take that frown. Like old Eeyore face there. Now Take listen, that here frown. we go. Shh, calm down. Listen. On the count of three. <laughs> this could be a, quite a major turning point in your life, Clarkson. And for this, there is no charge. One, two, three. Take, Take that, that frown, frown. Turn it upside, turn it upside down. down. Doesn't that feel better? No. Okay. <laughs>